Joe. Joe said everything I came to say today. <laughs> So I'll turn it up now. We really appreciate you all having this uh, Loudoun County Historical Society having us come today. Uh, this is a, kind of a long-term thing that we've dealt with with the cemetery, and we'll get into that more today. But I wanted to kind of start, I believe my long, lifelong friend, Lee Alexander, asked me months ago if I would speak and be willing. She knew what I was trying to accomplish at the cemetery and ask if I would be able, would be willing to present to the society. And she said, you know, there's usually 20 or 30 people there. And I said, sure. <laughs> okay, that, that was months ago. <laughs> and at, at that time, it didn't seem daunting to me at all to do that. As the months rolled around and we got closer and closer, I thought, you know, and more people said they were coming, and I was so excited that that many people were coming, but uh, still, I'm not a historian, and I'm not a trained speaker. I'm like Joe, followed in his footsteps in the teaching career, but I taught little kids, and you all are big people, so. <laughs> but I want to encourage you today, we're going to tell what we know about the history of the Lenore family. When we really started talking about today and what you would want to hear, we felt like when we were talking about the cemetery that we need to talk about the people as well. It's not just the physical land, but we're gonna talk about that too. But Lee called me back a few weeks after I agreed to do this and said, what's your title? Well, just out of the blue, I said, the Lenore Family Cemetery past and present. So I want to tell you a little bit about the past and of the Lenore family and how they came to be here. We feel like, as evidence on our uh, coat of arms, it says Lenore de Nott, and that is the Lenores of Nott, France. Our origins were in France, and um, we, we feel like our early ancestors, Lenore ancestors, came from the coast of France, the west coast, which is uh, not France, it's a seaside coastal village, and they were farmers and uh, men of the sea, mariners. And so they were also Huguenots, and being of the Huguenot faith, they were driven out of France, all, all the Huguenots were and they spread throughout Europe, and some of them fortunately came to America. And our first ancestor, this approved ancestor on the Lenore side, was Thomas Lenore, and he was born about 1700. And he came across the Atlantic and landed around York, Virginia. And he, was a, he continued his sea life in, around York, and he met a young lady named Morning Crawley. And to get that he married her and they moved inland and started farming. And they became successful farmers and farmed in several locations in Virginia. Then they decided to drift on down into North Carolina, to Western North Carolina, near Lenore, North Carolina. And they continued their tobacco farming there and were successful with that. They had quite a few, several children. The youngest child was William Lenore. And William Lenore um, grew up, and as he matured and grew, it was obvious that he was a born leader. He was a man of strong religious beliefs. He was a strong family man. He was very, very valued education later went on to become a, one of the founding members of the University of North Carolina. He met and married uh, Ann Ballard, and they had children, and um, their William, as their father, William Lenore, when the revolution came on, uh, he was one of the first early uh, ones to uh, join up. He couldn't wait to get started in his military career. And 
he was in several battles, and we know that he was shot several times, and in one skirmish, his horse was shot out from under him. And his most noted war battle was the Battle of Kings Mountain. And he was, that's where his leadership role really came into play was the Battle of Kings Mountain. For his faithful service in that battle, he, was, he came out of the military as a general and he was granted 5,000 acres of land on where we are today. It took years to get that legally binded as to, for him to claim this land. Uh, it was uh, not until 1810 that it was finally, the litigation was finally resolved and the land was rightfully deeded to him. By this time, he was an older person and he, he and his wife, their oldest son, was named William Ballard Lenore. And he challenged William Ballard, and William Ballard was married to a lady named Elizabeth Avery. And she was the daughter of Colonel Waitstall Avery, who was very, very instrumental in founding the United States. Uh, so they, he challenged them to come, gave, he deeded the land to them, and they came uh, in 1810 from Western North Carolina. They had, they brought, they came on wagons and they brought four children, their four children with them. They traveled with their livestock. They had help, their um, enslaved helpers help them get here across the rugged mountains of North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee. They arrived here and they found nothing. It was just very sparsely settled. There were a few people here, but it was very sparsely settled. Um, they were challenged then to, to do something with it. They, they rose to the challenge, they made it grow, and they ended up having I remember I said they came with four children. They ended up with 12 children. So the 12 children, as they grew and the family grew, that is what those children are what really helped him to make something of this area. They were into uh, heavily into manufacturing. They had cotton mills. They brought uh, flour mills, um, wood, wood mills, they, they did, they had everything going and with the help of these sons, mainly their sons, and the sons formed the, a company called the uh, Lenore Brothers Company, manufacturing company. So one of those sons was named Waitstall Avery Lenore. And Waitstall Avery, um, he, they had some, children and two of their daughters married to Norwood boys from North Carolina and that's where I and my family are from uh, that we descended from that line. Uh, my, grand, my grandfather who would have been West Lavery's grandson was named Avery Lenore Norwood. My father was Avery Lenore Norwood Jr. And my late brother was Avery Lenore Norwood III. And those three are very, very close together down one block down the street that you'll see in the cemetery when we go down after this is over. So that is, I'm, I'm representing the Norwood line. I have children here who are of that line. And I have my brother, Joe Norwood, that many of you probably know. Um, he has a son, Jody Norwood, and he has a son, Trey Norwood. So I'm happy to say that the Norwood name 
is still alive and we're <coughs> thankful for that. So, are you saying no pressure? <laughs> no pressure back there. They were just married last night, so we're here. <laughs> New Norwood. <laughs> but um, that kind of tells my one of the groups that the lines that are represented in the cemetery. As far as the cemetery itself goes, there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of it's something this old. It's really hard to say this is act exactly what happened. So we're not going to say that today. I'm not going to say that today, but I'm going to say, tell you kind of stories about, you know, as we go along about what I've heard. My, my, I've just told you the line of Avery's that lived here before, you know, that I'm part of, and then their parents and grandparents and my aunts and great aunts and uncles, uh, the stories that have shifted down through the time and, and they were here. They were here when it really happened. So I'm kind of going through that part of that way to the, get to the meat of things. But the cemetery itself, um, the Lenores, for a while when they were here, didn't need a cemetery. They were younger and they, their children were young. They just didn't need one. And there weren't that many people here either then when they got here. So the first, I always thought <coughs> growing up that there's a big tall monument, at least monument there that is William Ballard's and Betsy's uh, tombstone. I assumed that that was the first grave here. But after I really started digging into it, that's not no true. Problem. It was their five-year-old granddaughter that died first and it needed a place to be buried quickly followed by an infant uh, granddaughter. So that's the beginning of the Lenore family cemetery where those, those children. And then soon after, uh, William Ballard and Betsy passed and they were buried there and then it grew and it said, it was 12, 12 children, their family grew and there were a lot of, you know, need, there was a lot of need for a cemetery. So we feel like that, we know that Betsy was very, they, they were all religious. Remember, they were Huguenots and forced away because of their religious beliefs. So they were very religious and they came here. Uh, and as Lenore City grew, the manufacturing grew and drew people in, more denominations were represented in Lenore City and in this area with no church nowhere to meet. So we know that Betsy was instrumental in helping form, help those groups to not only form and grow, but to have a, play, a church, an actual physical church in which to meet. So they built the first church up in Martell, which is just a stone's throw up the road. And uh, her son, Israel Pickens Lenore, built that church for her. Then they, they came on into town and they had the cemetery going. It had started and so they, now this is where all the stories start coming in. We feel like that the, at one point that the, the land connected to the cemetery was given to the Methodist church. We think it was given to the Presbyterian church. We think it was given to, uh, I, I, I was thinking there was another denomination that it passed through before it even ended up. And, and we know for a fact now, I can start take, talking facts, because we have a quick claim deed dated 1949 uh, that my great aunt, decided to take it on my herself to kind of solidify things. It was so loose and there's, you know, who, who has the property now? Who has, who's getting it next? So she said that the, we have letters written from her that she was trying to get the heirs together to make a decision about it. 
So they finally ended up giving the land to the, they sold it for one dollar to the Baptist church. And in the deed, it stipulates that the Baptist church will forever, and the word forever is written in the document, the legal document, forever take in exchange for the land for them to build a church off that they would forever take care of the cemetery. So the Lenores did give the land to the church, the Baptist church eventually, in exchange for upkeep of the cemetery. They've done a great job with that through the years. Um, so that's kind of where we are with the past. That's like I said, we don't know a whole lot about the past as far as the technicalities are concerned, but we do know that that the, the, the Lenores did give that land and that the church is keeping it up. So at this time, I'm going to pass it on to Julie Lennox Sharifi, and she's going to tell you about another line of our family. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Um, I can talk my ear off in front of a table of people, but I'm a little nervous. Um, so if I'm just reading from this um, and not making eye contact, please forgive me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about Waysil, Colonel Waysil Avery Lenore. And a lot of history has been of the Lenore family has been told for generations, with much of it being traced to back to General William Lenore. But in that history are the allied families who married into the Lenores. Julie, excuse me, is that microphone on? I have no idea. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. 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 How's that? Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> That's you. the stuff that makes me nervous. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, one such family was the Averys, particularly Elizabeth Avery and her Selena Avery. Selena with Louisa Avery. Um, both were daughters of Whitestill Avery. Elizabeth Avery married Major William Ballard Lenore, and her sister Selena Louisa Avery married Colonel Thomas Lenore, both the sons of General William Lenore. One sister would remain a daughter of North Carolina, while another would become a daughter of Tennessee, helping to settle this area and the town we stand in today. We owe much to the women who bore the burden of their times. Unfortunately, it is rare that history shines a light upon these women. And it is true, that this is true of the Avery daughters. However, we can possibly peek into their characters by examining the lives of their father, Whitestill Avery, Colonel Whitestill Avery. His three times great-grandfather was Christopher Avery and his son, James Avery, who came to New England around 1630 and eventually settled in Connecticut. Waits the Lady was born in Groton, Connecticut on the 10th of May, 1741, the 10th son out of 12 children of Humphrey Avery and Jersua Morgan. He married the widow Leah Probart Franks, daughter of William Probart, in Newborn, North, Car Newborn, North Carolina in 78. He first attended Yale in 1763 and then graduated with first honors in his class from Princeton, where he studied between law between 1765 in 1766. Reading through his 1769 diary, written after he studied law under Littleton De Dennis in Maryland, he wrote almost daily of his passage across Virginia into North Carolina in his entry into the practice, in, in his entry into the practice of law. At a glance, his diary reads like an unassuming account of his journey, sometimes traveling barely 10 miles while other days riding almost 40. However, it also presents a picture of his character early on in his life, much of which remained unwavering throughout his lifetime. One can only imagine how arduous traveling any distance on horse would have been. On the 28th of February, he wrote about his difficulty crossing the Hall River, written, writing about how he and his horse had been carried down the river, narrowly being bashed against the rocks, only to continue riding another 18 miles soaking wet. For the next couple of days, he continued to ride through the rain when he came across another swollen river where he was, and this is out of his diary, his own words, carried down a great distance, floating on a stream, in great danger of falling down on huge rocks, upon, among, and between, which the waters were deep, engulfing, engulfing dashing, roaring with great noise. 
But happily, I got a hold of the verge of the bank, a little above the great fall, and with difficulty saved myself and horse. I then blessed the Lord for this single deliverance, and set forward and arrived at Salisbury the same day. It was common in those days that travelers could take nightly refuge in residences that they passed by. Often for a nominal fee, they could also get a meal. In mid-April, he set to ride 107 miles from Wilmington to Anson County Courthouse. This part of his journey is only one example of his Puritan values when he had asked to, or when he had taken shelter at a residence. But again in his words, went to bed supperless because the house looked too nasty for Christians to eat in. <laughs> Uh, two nights later, he found himself at a Highlander's small cabin where he slept on, dirt, on a dirt floor for the first time. Referring to the August 1855 edition of the North Carolina University Magazine, I was able to take note of his commitment to an independent republic. He was among the most prominent of those who held Attorney General for the Crown to a moral responsibility in the autumn of 72. He was a member of the Mecklenburg Committee that declared in favor of American independence in May of 1775, also known as the Mecklenburg Results. Still, Avery did not resign his commission as Attorney General to the Crown until the 10th of May of 76. He was a delegate of the Provincial Congress, which placed the province in the state of a military organization in August of 75, and was elected by that body a member of the Provincial Council. He was elected a member of the Provincial Congress in 75 and 76, where he was appointed by the Congress a member of the committee in which helped draft the first constitution of the state of North Carolina in 1776. He was in favor of the division of the legislative body into two houses and of good behavior as the, ten as the tenure of judiciary office. According to the Dictionary of North Carolina Biography, Governor David L. Swain say, said later in an, that an examination of the records would indicate that more of the Constitution of 1776 was in the handwriting of White Still Avery, sorry, of White Still Avery than was that of any other member of the committee. An ardent advocate for higher education, he was the author of the clause requiring the legislature to provide for higher education to, of the people, which stated, all useful learning shall be duly encouraged and promoted in one or more universities. White still was appointed as the state's, as, a, as the new state's attorney general on the 12th of January, 1777, and served in that role until May 8th, 1779. On the 12th of January, 77, Governor Castle appointed him commissioner with three others from North Carolina to act in conjunction with commissioners from Virginia to enter into a treaty with the Cherokee Indians. That treaty was concluded on the 20th of July, at Fort Henry on the Holston River, and is known today as Avery's Treaty. On the 3rd of July, 79, he was appointed by Governor Caswell as Colonel of Jones Regiment Militia. In 1781, finding the climate of the Low Country was impairing his health, he removed to the county of Burke, settled on a beautiful and fertile estate on the Catawba, known as Swan Ponds. That's not it, but that's where the house was at. When independence was secured, Wait still, enjoyed his family at Swan Ponds. He was for many years a member of, his, of assembly of the County of Burke and was in the assignment of all his affairs, public and private, one of the most methodical and systematic of men. His library was the most extensive and well-selected in the western section of the state. And when the state house was destroyed in 1831, Wait still's son, Isaac T. Avery, donated the only complete collection of the printed copies of the Acts and Journals of the General Assembly of the state known to exist. This library must have required have been required after he settled at Swan Ponds, because in 1780, during the occupancy of Charlotte, North Carolina, by Lord Cornwallis, his law office, his library, and most of his papers had been reduced to ashes, apart from those who, which had been stored at his friend Hezekiah Alexander's. The evidence of, this evidence of displeasure was visited only upon those who Cornwallis considered a leading offenders. Burke County elected him its representative to the House of Commons in 70, 1782, all the way through 1785, and again in 1793. He served one term in the Senate in 1796. 
No story of white slavery can be told without one of the without talking about the, one of the his encounters with the future young president, with the young future president. While try, trying a case in Jonesboro, Tennessee, in 1788, he engaged in a duel with a lawyer from the opposing side, a young Andrew Jackson. Mr. Jackson had taken offense to being mocked in open court by Mr. Avery, and to save his reputation, tore a piece of paper and wrote a challenge with which Avery did not respond to. The next day, Jackson wrote another challenge. <laughs> Dated the August 12th of 1788. Sir, when a man's feelings and character are injured, he ought to seek speedy redress. You received a few lines from me yesterday, and undoubtedly you understand me. My character you have injured. And further, you have insulted me in, my, in the presence of a court and a large audience. I therefore call upon you as a gentleman to give me satisfaction for the same, and I further call upon you to give me an answer immediately without equivocation, and I hope you can do without dinner tonight, or without dinner until the business is done. For it is consistent with the character of a gentleman when he injures a man to make a speedy reparation. Therefore, I hope you will not fail in meeting me this day. Your honorable student, Andrew Duxon. Avery's response was short and sweet. P.S. This evening, after court, adjourned. Exclamation mark. Reportedly, Jackson stopped, shot Avery and missed. Avery did not return fire, but approached Jackson, Jackson sorry, and lectured him much like a father would a son. After that, their dispute was settled, and the two remained on friendly terms. At least this is one version of the story. No matter which version you come across, this and the results are the same. Two men lived of the history of his family in Connecticut. We have some information. His brother Solomon Avery wrote from Groton in July 1783 to his brother Whitestill, telling him of the Battle of Groton Heights on the 6th of September 1781, which was led by none other than Benedict Arnold. Eleven Averys were killed at the fort at Groton, and seven were wounded. Many Averys have been killed in this war, but there has been no Tory of the name of Avery in these parts. Waitzel Avery died on the 15th of March in 1821 at his beloved Swan Ponds. The patriarch of, North, of the North Carolina Bar, an exemplary Christian, a pure patriot, and honest man. Waitzel Avery was survived by his wife, Leah Probart, and their four children, one being Elizabeth, who married Major William Bell of Lenore, eventually moving to this area around 1810, and was one of the early settlers of what became Lenore Station in Lenore City as we know it today. I will now hand the next portion of our program over to, sorry, I had to change my thing there, um, <laughs> to Miss Sandy Burdett Ramsey, who will discuss the Burdetts, which are another allied family of the Lenores. <laughs> George Godfrey Burdett and how he became part of the Lenore family. George hailed from Washington, Georgia in Wilkes County about 90 miles east of Atlanta. He was born January 5, 1838. He was the son of James W. Burdett and Margaret McKinney Burdett. He had one sister, Elizabeth, who was born around 1847. The Burdetts were an old and prominent family in Georgia history, however, we know very little about George's father, who died by his own hands in 1851, leaving Margaret and a 14-year-old George and 4-year-old Elizabeth. To the best of our knowledge, after James' death, Margaret took the children and went to live with her family. In 1861, we find George is a new graduate of the Medical School of Georgia in Augusta. Shortly after graduation, he enlisted in the Confederate Army and was appointed assistant surgeon to a hospital in Richmond, Virginia. He served four years and one month in a medical capacity. He was captured while tending the wounded in September of 1864 in Winchester, Virginia, and was traded in a prisoner exchange January of 1865. Lee would surrender in April of 1865, and George Burdett would return to Georgia. According to family stories, Georgia met, George met two Lenore brothers during the war. 
They invited George to come to Lenore's, as it was called at that time, if he found the devastation in Georgia beyond repair. The town of Lenore's had not escaped destruction, but the cotton mill had survived along with the Lenore residences. The other mills, stores, and rail that the Lenore brothers had built had been destroyed. Many items of livestock, household stock, and provisions had been taken, and the Lenore family had much to rebuild, regain, and recover. So, George took the Lenores up on their offer. We're not sure what business he must have conducted in Georgia, what plans he made with his family there, nor exactly when he, he arrived in Lenores, but I believe he must have left Georgia on good terms with his family, who would visit here for long weeks during the summer and there would be visits from Lenore City back to Georgia. We believe he was in Lenore's by around 1867 and know he was in residence by 1870. In the 1870 census, he's listed as a member of the Benjamin Ballard for Death, Benjamin Ballard Lenore household and was given the title of store clerk. In the 1880 census, he was listed as bookkeeper. It is evident from this information that George did not return to his medical practice for years after the war. Eliza Lenore, who was the granddaughter of William Ballard, and her father, Wexel Avery Lenore, namesake of who Julie has talked about, lived also in the Benjamin Ballard Lenore household. She was the Lenore little sister, and apparently she caught George's eye, and they married in June of 1873. Eliza was 21 and George was 35. Their first child was born in May of 1875 and died that same day. This would be the first of many losses of this kind for the family. Their second child, James Avery Burdett, was born in 1876 and was my grandfather. He was followed by Georgia in 1877 and Eliza in 1879. George was by now a part of the Lenore Manufacturing Company, which had been established following the war, serving as secretary treasurer, and was one of five stakeholders. He and Eliza were living with her father and continued to do so until Wakesell passed away. In 1888-89, Eliza and George built what is often called the Old Redette House. It was built in a Queen Anne style from material sourced from the surrounding land. The interior woodwork unique to each room included cherry, walnut, oak, burl, dogwood, bird's eye maple, and poplar. Furniture for each room was also custom built. The house sits on a hill above the road that is now St. Thomas Way. In the meantime, more children had been born and George had returned to his medical practice. Eliza and George had 15 children in all, including a set of triplets in 1891. In the following three months after their birth, they each died on separate days or weeks probably making the heartbreak even worse for the family. In total, seven babies are buried near George and Eliza in the family cemetery. Eight children survived to adulthood and they are the ancestors of some of us who are here today. They were James, Georgia, Eliza, Avery, Hattie, Jeanette, June, and Julia. George Burnett died in 1915, a few days after suffering a stroke of apoplexy. His funeral was attended by a massive crowd who came from far and wide. In the many obituaries written about him, he was described as a man dedicated to his community, well-respected and a devoted father. In a Confederate veteran publication, it was said that he was never, he was never found wanting for any relation of life. And don't we all hope that one day that can be said of us? But now, there's another person I've been asked to speak about. Her name is Gussie Young. Almost anyone who's related to the Lenores or the Burdettes knew Gussie or has heard stories about her. Gussie <coughs> came to the Burdett home sometime around 1900 and before 1905. My dad was born in 1905 and he told a story that places Gussie with the family when he was a baby. There are many differing stories about how this young black woman arrived at the Burdett house with two young boys. If you know any of these stories, I would love to hear them, so we might put those all together. At any rate, by 1905, Gussie Young lived in the Burdett home and worked for the family. Then she became part of the family and remained so until her death. As her boys grew older, one of them disappeared, the other one moved to Knoxville and would visit his mother in Lenore City. Gussie's buried in the family cemetery where she recently got a new headstone. You'll see that when we go down there. 
Dusty died when I was 11. I wrote a story about her for Black History Month a few years ago, and I don't know any better way to tell you about Dusty than to share that story with you. I took a little literary license here and there, so do forgive me for that, but here goes. In honor of Black History Month, people have been asked to name a black woman who inspired them. The participants have cited various well-known women. I immediately thought of Maya Angelou and the effect her writing had had on my life. But then, I thought of another black woman who had a profound effect on my life. Her name was Gussie Young, and she lived with my family from 1905 until she passed away in 1962. According to a family story, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, Eliza Burdett, found Gussie one day in downtown Lenore City. She had two little boys with her, and she seemed to be lost. After some investigation, Eliza asked Gussie and the boys to go home with her. They went with Eliza to the sprawling white Victorian house where, they li where she lived with her doctor husband, some grown children, and a few grandchildren, my father being one of those grandchildren. There Gussie went, and there Gussie stayed. She <coughs> lived with and cared for our family the rest of her life and was cared for them at the end of hers. Gussie could neither read nor write. She signed her name with an X and was slow to learn new things. She was easily confused by anything newfangled. She refused to use the electric lights when they came along. She carried an old flashlight with her so she could see her way in the dark. She could make no sense of the radio and where all those sounds came out, but she did like to listen to it. She wore thick cotton stockings tightened in a knot right below her knees to hold them up, and tennis shoes with holes cut in them to accommodate her bunions. But she made the best tea cakes in the world. By the time I came along, Gussie and my great aunt Georgia had moved to town to a smaller house. Great grandmother Eliza had passed away, the old house had been sold, and the two of them moved to Hill Street in Lenore City. In the dining room of that house was a fancy cupboard with glass doors, and then there were the tea cakes. When mother and daddy would visit aunt Georgia, I would have one of Gussie's tea cakes and a glass of milk. We would talk about very, very important things, and she would laugh this funny, little, crinkly laugh. And usually, somehow, I would step on her toes that hurt. But when I was small, I would sit on her lap and listen to the adults carry on their conversations. Gussie would hold my hands in hers, and I would study her hands intently because they looked so different from mine. But the differences didn't matter. It was the love and the feeling of security that came from a woman who never read a recipe, much less a book, and told time with the trains and the lunch whistle at the Lenore Car Works. Gussie's face has faded from my memory, but I do remember the tennis shoes and her bunions. I also remember her hands and her tea cakes and her unconditional love for me. When she became ill, Aunt Georgia, my mother, and others cared for her, and she was buried in the family cemetery. So during Black History Month, but now today, on Lenore Family Day, I honor this fine woman who loved, who loved me and whose kindness has never left my heart or my mind. She may not have wanted to push the buttons on those new electric lights, but she never hesitated when it came to me. And I thank you, Gussie. And thank all of you for being here today with us. And I think I'm going to turn it back over to Beverly. Thank you all. Uh, the lady sitting here on the front is one great thing that has come about from us doing all this. I knew Sandy growing up, but we drifted apart for many, many years. The other ladies, uh, I didn't even know, there were cousins that I've now become very close to and uh, treasured their, not only their cousinship, but our friendship as well. Uh, I told you on the beginning about the, the present, the past of the cemetery and the people, and they filled in some blank spaces for us. So fast forward about seven decades to maybe two years ago, and we'll talk about the present state of the cemetery. I grew up, I was raised and grew up in Lenore City, but moved away early on. I had to go away to school and to live a different amount of life. And 
uh, still kept close contact with my family in Little Rock City. But about three years ago, I was fortunate and blessed enough to move back to this area. And, you know, we, I guess as we age, we really treasure being able to find our roots. And I have certainly found my roots back here. Um, have made so many great contacts and re reconnected. Uh, one of the first things I did when I came back was to visit the cemetery where some of the people we've talked about today or most of the people are buried there and my parents and grandparents and many relatives and I thought one afternoon I was just going to drive down and just be there. I just wanted to spend some time there. So I pulled in. The, the cemetery that we're talking about is one block just south of us, just behind me down the street. Uh, so I pulled in and the parking is on, we're on 2nd Avenue and it's on 1st Avenue. And then the, I pulled in and the, the there's a slope down to the proper cemetery where the, the burials are. When I was young, it was, we would run up and down the, the slope without any trouble. And I don't know if it has anything to do with that was, you know, 50 and 60 and 70 years ago that I was running up down that slope. But that day, I didn't run down it, I slid down it. I, I think, I want to say that erosion over time has made that bank, that slope, turned it into a steep bank. <laughs> uh, I got down in there and the first thing I thought about was how am I going to get back out. <laughs> but I did, I, I obviously got out, but I got down into the graves and I was standing there at my parents' graves and just reminiscing and, and feeling peace. And, uh, before I realized it, I had tears coming down my cheeks and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm sad, I miss my people, but that wasn't really why the tears were there. The tears were there because as I looked around, I saw things that I just couldn't accept. I could not accept the fact that I had to slide down that bank to get to my parents' grave. I couldn't accept the fact that nowhere in that cemetery was there any indication at all of who was there and why they were there and how they got there. There was nothing. There was no marker at all, nothing. I couldn't accept the fact that inches away from the founder of Lenore City, was a tarp covering the dilapidated house next door that was in shambles with a tarp on the roof with ropes coming, heavy ropes, five or six heavy ropes coming across to the inside of the cemetery on a wall that's very fragile at best, thinking of the age of it. And not only were they just coming across, they were nailed and screwed into the concrete, into the box, and making holes. And that was unacceptable. But the worst, I get, I, I try to think what's the worst part, and the worst part was the trash. The whole alleyway on the southern boundary was loaded with trash. It had bicycle parts, tires, wheels, rusted hoods of cars, it had uh, grills, toys, just all that you can imagine, just paint cans, probably several hundred paint cans, empty paint cans just stacked and rolling everywhere. Totally unacceptable. And I thought, this is a disgrace to my family, to my parents, to my family, and to the ones that are coming ahead. I mean, it was really not in good shape. So I, I don't even really remember how I got back up the hill, but I did. 
And I mentioned earlier an aunt, my great aunt, Louisa Norwood, um, having had, you know, headed up to getting the quick claim deed for the church and the land and all. Things that she had written about kept coming into my mind, and at first I was kind of angry about it. She wrote things like, "We have to make we have to make a connection and get together and do something because the generations to come, they're not going to know anything about this. They're not going to be involved in it. They're not going to know it's there. They're not going to." really even care that there's anything wrong with the cemetery and I thought wait a minute <laughs> I, we do care we I know that there I'm not the only one that would care about the cemetery so I, I, I've turned my anger into challenge I, I that's I'm going to use the word challenge she challenged me and I think she gave me the key to make to help this happen uh, that challenge that she threw out there many, many years ago of carrying it forward. So I came away that day with hope in my heart, with faith in my heart that something could be done. And thanks and blessings to my many cousins and brother and nephews and nieces and sons and daughters, we have together made a change. I do think we've made a change. We've passed out a, a handout with pictures of the before. Uh, some of you may have it if, if you can share with people. Lee, can I hold it up and show them which one it is? It looks like this. And if you'll look on the front, it does show the tarp. It shows the trash. It shows the bank. It shows the the four things that I zeroed in on that we needed help with was, was getting down to it, the access, a marker telling what it is and who's there and why. We needed uh, the trash down and we needed uh, some, some type of landscaping to form some boundaries to help us give a little privacy. It's like just a field, and we, we wanted it more like a cemetery, a place of, of beauty. So we're hopeful that we've accomplished that, and with help from many, many people, the city has helped us, the historical society has helped us uh, make all this happen, and um, we're just blessed that we could you know, pull together and do it. Graham, I'm going to ask Graham Perry to come up. He has been an advisor to me through all this, or to us, and an encourager, and uh, he's helped me through, figure out some situations. So, Graham is just going to say a little bit, and then I'll tell you again. We'll see you again. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Y'all have been very, everybody's been very kind to me today. Um, I, I know that really with my role at the Tennessee Historical Commission, one of my primary jobs is to be a cheerleader for groups such as this one to uh, basically seize the day and do something about their family cemeteries. And, you know, I, my, most of all my family cemeteries are in North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama, so I don't really have much of a Tennessee connection, except I am descended from Robin Adair, the guy that lived with the uh, Chickasaw and the Cherokee for 30 years and wrote about it. And, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but nevertheless, there are so far in the database that I have been accumulating since I uh, started this job three years ago, 32,500 cemeteries across the state. And let me tell you, there are more coming up every week. So hopefully by the time I retire or die in office or something, um, it will keep going and the next person will continue to do this. In 500 years down the line, somebody's going to thank us all for doing that. Um, but I, I love the job as a cheerleader because I always tell people that, I mean, I actually have a sign that I wrote on my desk that says grief counselor. The grief counselor is in. 
Because a lot of people call initially about cemeteries and they are upset about their family cemetery and they want to know what they can do about it. Of course, the first question most people ask is, does the state have any money I can have? And of course, the answer is no. But um, my job is to help to connect people to resources that might be available to look at things from, uh, I mean, even though there might not be cemetery grants, I know the DAR has them, but... Um, you know, there are ways to achieve other grants if you can approach cemetery uh, history from certain angles. And I try to spend time familiarizing myself with those and getting more and more and more new, uh, just ways to look at those things so that I can help people to do that. The people that I've met all over the state, like this gamble here and uh, all of you, uh, Y'all provide something that when I get this same questions that she has given me later on, I can say, oh, do you know who you need to contact? You need to contact Beverly Gamble because she's done this before. And I kind of can kind of explain to them what happened. I was like, but if you want more information, there she is. And I try to do that with everybody across the state, West Tennessee, East Tennessee, whatever. Um, it, it's kind of weird not having any funding for a position and having to like create it from nothing. Cemetery, uh, Tennessee never had a historic cemetery program. All of surrounding states do. Arkansas's had one since 1969. North Carolina's got one. Alabama's got a really good one. And so they literally created my position. And for some reason, somebody finally decided that I was somebody that they could turn loose to build something. Uh, usually I was always, had management and everything that was always looking over my shoulder, but nobody knew anything about cemetery preservation in Tennessee, and so guess what? I had to learn myself, and I'm one of these kind of people, I'm, I love to learn about things, and I didn't really know anything about cemetery preservation. I came from a museum. Um, I came from the Tennessee State Museum. I knew about artifact preservation and, and archival things, because we had a NEH grant, but Literally, when I walked in to the office that first day, I had my first cemetery crisis in Rutherford County where some bulldozing guys had bulldozed a well-known historic cemetery. I knew nothing about cemetery law in Tennessee. I, I mean, literally, I had to learn now, right then, to try to be able to help resolve that. And so I have, because of that, it was a good thing that it came that quickly because I realized right then that I need to become as familiar as I could with anything in Tennessee code, in Tennessee law, or whatever that might pertain to cemeteries. T Title 46 is where most of the cemetery law is, but guess what? There are things tucked away elsewhere, too, and I've been accumulating those. And hopefully when people call and they have problems with their cemeteries, I can turn them on to those uh, codes. I've, I've talked to lawyers, uh, um, district attorneys. I'm, I'm working with the district attorney now about some de desecration. But um, people did not know I existed. They, did, they knew that Tennessee Historical Commission existed, but nobody knew we had a cemetery program. And now we have a cemetery program. And my goal is to make it even better than Arkansas's at Holly Hope. My, you know, my colleague over there is like, I want mine to be better than hers. But anyway, she's great. Um, I have gotten help from other states as far as trying to figure out what to do. Um, so I spend a lot of time just trying to accumulate resources. Like I know that there's a monument person here today that I'm supposed to meet. And that's very important because I don't have a very big list of them. Um, and I try to accumulate these specialists so that I can send out lists of people that, you know, whatever your issue is with your cemetery, somebody on that list might, might, might be able to help you. And, uh, and again, I also take calls about if you have your cemetery desecration, don't be shy about reporting desecration. Um, Tennessee law is not particularly, it's not really stringent compared to other states. So it's something that the cemetery committee, which was put together to work with me to look at Tennessee cemetery law to see how it can be shoreline, you know, streamlined. 
uh, so that it makes more sense. Um, yeah, anytime those things are reported to the police or reported to your legislator or something like that, then people up in the, the Tennessee General Assembly know that there's a problem. And I always say the more the merrier, because if we can get like thousands of those reports, then maybe when the cemetery committee and I make suggestions to make the law better, they'll actually do it. Um, yeah, but I, I really enjoy this. I mean, I, I grew up, my mother was a genealogy freak, and my grandfather on the other side was, and somehow I wound up with all the papers, and so somehow I've become that. Um, but it's so fascinating, and I, I just, you know, and this sounds kind of weird. I want the people in the cemeteries to come alive, but not really. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm always trying to encourage people, like for instance, young people with cemeteries, that's one of the biggest conundrums is how to get young people interested in caring for cemeteries. And there are some ways to do that that I've been thinking about. And one of the things that I go around preaching in the entire state is don't forget that college track students have to get service hours in. And that is a way, now I had to kick my, take my kids kicking and screaming to the things that I, I did, but once they got there, they were like, wow, this is a great place. So, you know, it gives you a chance to take those folks out there, give them their hours that they need to, you know, be able to get accepted into a college, but at the same time, you can teach them about the history of the people that are buried there, the people that were close to you. And it makes those people come alive to where the, they, they may have a connection to them. Not everybody's going to have a connection to it. But if you don't try, nobody's going to, you know. So those are the kind of things I like to try to do is try to just find out ways to get young people. Don't forget about Boy Scouts. There's a Boy Scout law, Eagle Scout projects. Um, you can also get prisoners. A lot of people don't like to do that, but they're nonviolent offenders. And you have to, like, go to your county to, uh, to, to do that, but there are ways to get your cemeteries maintained. Cemetery maintenance, and you know this firsthand, is something that it just, you can't just do it once and then it stops. That's not the way it works. Mother Nature is always running against you, and you know, eventually, as we, as Dan Conroy used to say at the museum, our job as curators at the museum was to prolong the inevitable. The fact is, everything that we see here today, whether it be a tombstone or whatever, is destined to become dust. But what we can do is we can work to preserve them for as long as we can. And even when they're deteriorating, there are ways that you can still honor the deterioration where people can look at the old tombstone and say, that's really neat, but oh my gosh, right next to it's a marker that explains the whole story. Um, it's, it's so important to take these stories of our ancestors that, and some of them are myths, but that's beside the point. I, I just proved a bunch of myths in my family, and it made people mad, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, it, the stories themselves, whether mythological or not, they are all a part of who we are. They were all a part of who we are gr growing up. Um, the people that are buried in the cemetery down here, they were told those same stories and those same myths from people in their families, just like we were. And it's an ongoing connection all the way back to the beginning of time. And that's why I think cemetery is important. And you'll be happy to know that our cemetery law in Tennessee and most throughout the United States uh, comes directly out of British common law, which came directly out of Roman law. So these cemetery rules that we come up with, they're not just these arbitrary things that we thought about. They were based on custom for thousands of years. And, you know, I bet it didn't start with the Romans either. I bet you it started before them as well. They just have to write it down. Um, yeah, this, this is our connection to the beginning of time and to the future, to the end of time. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it means a lot to me. And... What you are doing means a lot to me because I want everybody to do what you're doing. I really do because I can't do it myself. I need you. 
It's like I need all the information that I get about cemeteries, every little bit. I put in a file, I build a cemetery file for that particular cemetery. I put it in the database and, you know, hopefully one day, a few hundred years from now, people are going to go, wow, Tennessee has such an extensive database with cemeteries and the history of the people that are in them and hopefully cemetery maps. Oh my gosh. Because let me tell you, most cemeteries are not mapped. And... Oh, is that cemetery map? I don't. I don't know. No. Is it? No, let's go look. But you know, and I'm always encouraging people go out. And, you know, if, if all you can do is go out there and record the information that's on the tombstones and where they are, GPS where those graves are, so you know at least where those graves are. I mean, that's a start. Um, the fact of the matter is when you go out into a cemetery and you might see two or three tombstones, a lot of times there are a lot more people buried there. Um, and, and that comes into the practical matters when people are trying to relocate cemeteries, which I also tell people deal with. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I, I'm, just, I'm so honored to be around groups of people like you, like everybody. I want, and, and like I said, you are going to be the poster child for things that I'm going to suggest to other people throughout the, the state. Because once they see you and what you're doing, they're going to be like, hey, there's too many of those people. What, how can I get those people? And they can do it in their own communities as well. And that is really, honestly, the only way we're ever going to preserve, preserve all this stuff is through interest and excitement. And I'm your cheerleader. Um, if y'all, anybody has any questions about what I do, um, I, I will stay around for that too when we go to the cemetery and I've got some cards and things like that, but um, I just want you to know I really appreciate your work and I really thank you for including me in the process. We're honored. Okay. Uh, thank you, Graham. And Graham looked right at me when he said, I need you, so my... I'll be calling you from my new cemetery consulting firm. <laughs> uh, we're going to move our meeting. For those of you that would be kind enough to join us, one block down and go out the